there are two scenes that I want us to reflect on in relationship to these readings. The first scene is the prophet Elijah. You know, the scene is set up in such a way that Elijah and a part of that prophetic mission was during very stormy times in Israel's history. And it was right after King Ahab married the pagan Jezebel. And Jezebel tore down the altars that were dedicated to God. And she established worship sites to the pagan god Baal. Now, in response to that, Elijah had successfully confronted the priests of Baal, and he executed them. And this enraged Jezebel, and he had to flee for his life feeling like a failure and doubting where God's presence was in his life and God's support for his mission. So today we find ourselves, the scene is that Elijah is hiding in a cave, seeking shelter in solid rock. But just as he finds shelter in this cave, along comes these uh, hurricane winds, and then the earthquake, and then the fire, and all of it, it says, God was not present in those moments. And in the midst of it, I'm sure Elijah is like, where is God in all of this? And in the midst of that, what he needed to do, because the following says, it was in the small whispering sound. You know, if I start whispering to you, you know, one of the things you have to all of a sudden switch and it's like, I have to really listen. I have to really start leaning in to hear what's happening. I have to get closer. And I think it's in the midst of that whispering sound, that tiny whisper where, of which God speaks. And there's another commentator speaking about this who said it's better translated as the voice of silence. And I think the same is for us and in our lives. We need to be able to uh, hold back on the bantering that happens in life and our yelling out that we can be able to lean in to hear the word of God, God speaking to us, and in the tiny whisper, in the voice of silence. So that's the first scene I want us to think about in relationship to these readings. The second scene is the gospel. And the scene is that we're on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is seven and a half miles wide and 13 miles long. So we got a pretty significant body of water here. And on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee, it's 150 feet deep. It's a large body of water. So Jesus comes walking on the water, it says, during the fourth night of the watch. So we are talking about between 3 and 6 a.m., the darkest part of the night. And the storm, it's a bad one, all right? We've all seen them. We may have been a part of one of those storms when, you know, we just have to take cover and know with the lightning and the wind and all that comes a part of that. So we have a significant storm, and they're out there in 150 feet of water. The boat, no doubt, you know, it was one of the fishing boats of Andrew or James and John, you know, they're all fishermen. And so one of their boats now, a typical fishing boat of the time, 
would be seven and a half feet wide by 26 and a half feet long. We're not talking about a huge boat here, but you know, this is the boat in which the disciples would have been in. And they're out here on the sea. So think about this scene. The northern part of the Sea of Galilee, during the darkest part of the night, a storm coming on, the disciples in a small tiny boat, and Jesus, he's not with them. He's on the mountain, and he's praying. And at the beginning of this passage, um, he appears at some distance, walking towards them. Now, I love this passage, and the reason I love this passage is, and it's even a little clearer in Mark's gospel, and you know, there's always this copying going between Matthew, Mark, and you know, similar usage, but in Mark's gospel, and, and in Matthew today, as we heard, it says Jesus made them get into the boat, but it's clearer in Mark's gospel where they're going because they're being called to leave the Jewish side where they are, and they have to go to the other side. But to go to the other side means you're going to be landing in Gentile territory. So that's what Jesus is saying to them. He's like, sail to the other side and go and minister on the other side. And it's in this crossing that we could say all the storms break out and everything that is happening around them uh, begins to let loose. But that's the context. And I want us to think about that. Think about any time in your own life when you've been made to do something. And, and Jesus asks us to come out of that comfort zone of where we are and make it across to the other side. Well, in Mark's gospel, again, a little bit clearer with this, because as they're called to do that, I like to liken it to this. If we were called to leave Milwaukee, cross over Lake Michigan to the other side, and then all the storms come up and everything, and then they end up in Kenosha, okay? So they never really get to the other side. They weren't ready to minister to people on the other side. The Jewish community there was not ready for all the adventure that would happen as they would preach the gospel to the Gentile community. And so they end up a little bit farther down on Jewish territory. That's the context of this in Mark's gospel. But all those comfort zones that we are invited to step out of, in order to bring that to someone else. So what do we learn from these scenes and how do we take that forward for us today? You know, the Sea of Galilee represents the world. You know, you and I were born into this time and into this place. This is the piece of history in which you and I are called to be sailing, uh, where we spend our time and our lives. And aren't we blessed to be sailing through 2020, you know, and I'm sure, you know, and you even see some different comments about 2020 out there on social media and people are like, just want to forget this year. But nevertheless, this is the year in which we're sailing. This is the time when we are called to bring forth that good news. So this is the sea that we are sailing. But remember also the darkest part of the night, it's the fourth watch, which represents whatever darkness there is within our lives. And if we are honest, we all have these dark parts of life. And sometimes we don't know exactly why that is happening. It's just part of our life that's dark. It's not the bright areas. And we've all got them. And then there's the storm that whips up, representing all of the problems that we can have in life. Problems that can be great and small, 
which we seem to have absolutely no control over. Elijah had no control over the storms that were in his time, and the disciples didn't have control over this storm. But nevertheless, it's that moment in which we find ourselves. And I know for all of us, it doesn't take much imagination for us to identify with those terrified disciples in the boat as we face the deadly storm of this pandemic with its indiscriminate power to kill, which is sweeping across the world. Do we feel like those disciples, victims in that boat? We also find ourselves navigating the floodwaters of social change, along with the cultural earthquakes of our time. Because at the same time of this virus, we witness the killing of George Floyd. We've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, sparking protests not only in our own nation, but across the world calling for an end to racism, an end to injustices, an end to the violence. Last week as a nation, we reflected on the death of John Lewis, you know, one of the towering figures of civil rights in our nation. And as he was laid to rest, as his voice was silenced, but yet continues to live on as he spoke for that end to racism and injustice in our nation. But we also see the exploding violence that uh, continues throughout our cities. And then over and over again, we're confronted by the actions and the inactions of our government in Washington. And irregardless of what side we may find ourselves on, you know, hearing the constant blaming of one another going on between our nation's leaders as we face a presidential election less than three months from now. And in the midst of that, we see the swirl and we feel, you know, that inaction that happens. And then to just add to the chaos, we can throw in the issues of a struggling economy because of this virus, the staggering unemployment numbers and immigration issues as well. And those who are here and we know as a community that we are drowning in chaos. Then there are the storms of our own personal lives, taken away from all the issues going around us. And think about your own life. And what about those personal issues, those moments of darkness that you face, the anxiety navigating this, the tensions that may be there, a sickness or an illness, uh, the fears that people have. But in the midst of all of that, and all that we can't even begin to name, that we struggle with as we navigate these waters. Each of us has those darkness. Each of us have those storms in our lives. And then the boat. Think about the boat. It's small. Remember last week's gospel when Jesus says to his disciples, well, go feed them. And they're like, we have five loaves and two fish. What are we going to be doing to feed this multitude? So now you can imagine the disciples saying, we are in the tiniest of boats and we are out here in 150 feet of water and the storms are going, the boat is being knocked around and tossed about. And how small and insignificant we can feel when we're being tossed about on the Sea of Galilee. 
So what do we do? I believe that God calls us. I believe that in the midst of those moments that Jesus walks out to us as well. And as we see, we cry out to the Lord in our prayer. But I think what we need to do is what the disciples did. They bring him into the boat. And think about this for a moment because the gospel was quite clear. Just when Jesus arrives, it doesn't mean that the storms of life stop around them. Oh no, because here we have Peter who says, Lord, if that's really you, let me come out there. Let me come by you. And so he tries it as he begins to walk. And then he begins to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And the gospel is quite clear. It's only when Jesus got into the boat, when Jesus is in there, then everything became calm. And the winds died down and the seas roared no more. So as we take these scenes in to our own lives in this time and in this week, I think the gospel and the word of God is inviting us to invite Jesus into our boats. The invitation to have Jesus with us on that journey. But it's also that we need to be able to quench you know, that around us. We need to start beginning to still that ranting and raving that's going on within. We have to begin to silence that. Because like Elijah and the scene from Elijah, we need to start leaning into the Lord. We need to start listening for that tiny whisper, that voice of silence that is seeking to speak to us in the midst of the raging storms. You know, and sometimes we would like, and I'm sure Elijah would have loved it if God spoke in the midst of that earthquake or if God spoke to him in the midst of that hurricane winds that were bashing against the rocks. You know, God, take up and do that mighty act. But it was in the whispering sound. It was in the small, still voice. And it's in those moments when we can still our hearts to listen. And then we can tune our ears to the Lord. And God can say to us, I am with you. I have not forgotten. I have not abandoned you. And it's in those moments that Jesus is going to say to us, get into the boat. He's going to make us get into the boat. And he's going to make us go where we do not want to go. Because he wants us to know that he is with us and he has not forgotten. So let us, in our hearts, in our lives, let us be open to where God is leading. Let us be open to those calls around us. And yes, we feel all of this happening is swirling around us. But let us also be able to pray, to turn to our God, to trust, and to know Jesus will say to us, it is I. Do not be afraid.